So far, so good. <laughs> again <laughs> successful relaunch <laughs> thank you for your patience <laughs> thank you okay so we have now exited executive session um, we met with the town attorney regarding the paper streets litigation and no action was taken by the council at this time um, so now we will move on to the rest of our regular meeting, starting with town council reports and correspondence. Anyone have any reports or correspondence? Um, I just wanted to note briefly, there was some correspondence we received about absentee ballots and the upcoming election. Um, and we will have some more information about that for everyone in September, but um, part, part of what is going on right now is that everyone is still figuring everything out at the state level and Deb's been working hard on this. So um, we'll have an update on that coming in September. Um, any other town council reports of correspondence, Jamie? Can I just ask a question on that, Deb? Uh, actually directed to Deb, when when does um, absentee balloting or voting start or when is it scheduled to start? I think it was in your memo, but I forgot the date. Yeah, the requests for absentee ballots are available about third, uh, 90 days prior to an election. So last week, um, the request became available. Um, the ballots themselves won't be in until about 30 days prior. As we did with July, there will be requests from voters, encouragement, uh, that everything goes back and forth by mail. We're still waiting to hear from the state whether or not there'll be a drop-off box um, option. Uh, in July, there were several executive orders relating to the administration of the election. We don't know if those will carry over. Um, the state has not yet posted the um, online request service to request ballots, which most uh, voters use to request their ballots. When that is available, we'll post the link. Uh, because this election was so close to the other, the state has to make some changes because there's different you know, changes from the primary to a general and they just haven't been able to update it yet. So we're waiting for that update. And so as soon as that's available, we'll put that link on the website. So much like July, we're in a holding pattern waiting to see what protocols and, and uh, executive orders are going to be in place so that we can move forward. As we do, we'll inform the public as well. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. Valerie? I just wanted to let everyone know that we've set up a civil rights committee. And right now, we're taking applications for appointments to that committee. If anyone's interested, please email Deborah Lane, and you can set up um, an interview. The interviews will be this month, and we'd like to get that, um, uh, all of our 
appointees together so we can get that started um, first of September. So if anyone's interested, contact Deb Lane or go on our website and I believe they can get applications, right, Deb, on the website. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Nope. Okay. So I will turn this over to you, Jamie, for the Finance Committee report. Thank you. Um, so the dashboard went out earlier today and I uh, hope you've all had a chance to look that over. Um, Matt, I actually have just a couple of questions that I wanted to bring up and welcome any questions from anyone else. Um, one is in the area of excise taxes. Um, even though we're just, a, you know, this just reflects one month into the budget year, um, pacing um, pretty favorably on that, but do you have a sense of, um, do you or John have a sense on how much of that is sort of delayed revenue versus forecasted? Or was that built into the forecast or? Well, uh, we, we are capturing some uh, that was, you know, lingering over from the end of the last fiscal year into this year, but it's, uh, but a lot of it is, there, there is a lot of new car activity that's taking place. Uh, and there's a lot of registrations that have taken place. So I think the numbers are pretty good, but I think it may reflect uh, partly from uh, carryover from the end of the last fiscal year, but uh, also partly from probably equal parts of uh, new car purchases that are, that are happening. We have, uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the dealers have been fairly aggressive in their sales and we've had a lot of that activity that's been coming in. So I think we're, yeah, I was, I was somewhat surprised by that number. Uh, but, and I know that the ladies downstairs in the collector's office have done a lot of work uh, to, to get the, you know, the pent up demand process through uh, and, and caught up to speed with that fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, by by a Herculean efforts on their end, so uh, we get a little bit of both. Though I think this is what we're capturing there. So uh, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it for next month and see how that translates in the uh, after the August financials are through. I think you know next two to three months will be more telling than perhaps the first month it would be. Okay. Um, my second question is: um, I I read I think in the last few days um, about uh, the governor's finance director directing state agencies to uh, reduce their current year budgets by 10%. And um, I haven't seen anything specifically come, you know, through some of the things that I follow, but didn't know if at the manager's level, you're hearing anything about any impacts that might have. And is, I, I know you had done work, um, you and the, and the staff had done good work to bring down our, our forecasted revenues, you know, based on what your gut was telling you when we were in the budget process, but um, just with that news, I just wanted to sort of take your temperature on on what potential impact you anticipate from that. Well, no, thank you. I think that I appreciate the question. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's foremost on most uh, municipal managers and finance directors minds is uh, what the state impacts are going to be. And part of it is that uh, we did have it built in uh, as far as specific to what we're looking at there is probably revenue sharing uh, was was a bigger concern. And back in March, when they came up with their first uh, anticipated revenue sharing numbers, I think they had put us down for about eight hundred and sixty thousand. And then uh, that's. But if you recall, in our in in the town's budget, we forecast seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, for revenue sharing for the year. Uh, we received an update last week from the state regarding what their revised revenue sharing impacts are going to be. And I think that takes into account uh, much of what uh, Governor Mills and her staff were looking at regarding the, the, the cutbacks that they were looking to have at the state budgetary level. And the revised number for revenue sharing was 762,000 roughly for the town of Cape Elizabeth. So I think that our building that in uh, to the initial uh, estimate or to the revised estimate uh, played out very well for us uh, because we're not looking at trying to now recover that gap between the 860 and the 760. So I think the adjustment that we made there proactively uh, is going to suit us uh, going well uh, for this year. That's that's the big one when it comes to it uh, from the state revenue side of it. Uh, and you'll notice, you know, we we got roughly 10% of it in the last in the last month. So uh, I think, you know, we'll keep monitoring that obviously as the year goes by, but. Uh, 
I think that initial strike on the town's end, uh, I think is going to suit us well. And then my last question is a small thing, but I've been meaning to ask this, and I it, it, just seeing it in the Portland Headlight gift shop sales numbers. Um, obviously, we expect those to be down on fewer vehicle um, visits and, and visitor count and all that kind of stuff. Were we early enough in the, I know that they purchase a lot of their inventory, um, you know, fairly far in advance. Were we early enough with sort of readjusting to have captured and, and pivoted uh, on that or, or were there a bunch of sunk costs that, I mean, I know some of that stuff can just, you know, get stored and whatnot. It's not like it has no use whatsoever, but just on the expense side there. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question as well. And something that we've looked at I think we're in decent shape when it comes to that. There was obviously some pre-purchase there, but I think Jean uh, moderated her purchasing uh, as, it, as it was going forward. Uh, a lot of times she'll purchase things during the course of the year. And, uh, and so she'll try to re replenish stock. Uh, on the other side, she's also had, you know, there've been some savings as far as some labor costs down there with managing you know, managing our different operations and, you know, related to the gift shop and the, uh, and the museum. But, uh, but I think she's moderated that to hopefully offset it. Yeah, the numbers are, are silly when it comes to what we normally would receive down there. So, uh, although, you know, looking at, uh, if, I, if I could shift for a moment, just looking at the, the park in general, the fact that we pulled in, uh, you know, via the parking meter, $61,000 in revenue gross last month was, uh, a bit of a surprise because June uh, was quite a bit more uh, conservative, and over the past, you know, four weeks, we definitely have seen the activity pick up there. So uh, that's that's somewhat encouraging. Uh, looking at the numbers there, so uh, we'll see how that how that goes forward. But uh, but I think all those numbers at the fort are are going to be challenged this year. Uh, bus and trolley revenues are the ones that are uh, we. I still have a high level of concern there. Thanks. Um, so does anybody else have any questions or anything they wanted to bring up uh, related to the finance report? All right, thanks. Thank you, Jamie. Um, all right, next item on the agenda is an opportunity for any citizen in attendance to raise an item not on the agenda. Um, I will note we had seven attendees earlier. We now have five attendees. So if anyone here has a, um, an item not on the agenda that they'd like to raise, this is your opportunity. Uh, this would be George, uh, George we, we should be unmuting you. You should be good to go here. Uh, just a quick question is, do you know when the paper streets might again rise on the agenda? Um, we need to discuss that as a council. So I imagine um, we would maybe want a workshop just to briefly discuss our next action, if any. Um, in September, maybe I don't know what our September workshop is looking like, Matt. Could could possibly uh, have have it as an item on the council agenda to send to workshop in in September. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to be sure we didn't miss anything. Thank you, uh, Deb Murphy. And just a reminder, um, please do. Uh, identify yourself and address for the record. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. This is Deborah Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. It's nice to see all of you. Um, I just wanted to um, provide my support for acceptance of Surfside and Atlantic Place and thank you all for the work that you've done to date um, and the town for all that you've done. We really appreciate it. And um, if we can help in any way, we'd, we'd love to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so not seeing any additional hands raised. Um, 
Matt, I'll turn it over to you for the town manager's report, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to start off the, this evening speaking about community services and they just wrapped up their summer camp this past Friday. Uh, the final day was enjoyed mm -hmm. with a bike rodeo and a visit by the ice cream truck. Uh, this, is a, this is a different summer camp experience by uh, <laughs> the understatement of the year there. Uh, they had no, no field trips or anything off campus, but uh, the kids really had a good time and they, they were very creative as far as uh, finding ways to amuse the campers. Uh, but this is a very successful camp and we are very grateful for the roughly 120 campers who we had this summer. A special thank you uh, has to go out to Kelly Finney who uh, and our, our camp director and Kathy Raftis, community services director and the staff for their creative efforts to provide this valued service to families. Uh, last week, I did send an email out to all the participants thanking them for participating in this year's program and for all their efforts to help keep the campers safe. It wasn't without their, their help that we could get this done. And you might have noticed SACO closed their camp halfway through the summer in their community services building. And uh, that was unfortunate, but uh, Kelly, Finney, Kelly Finney really doubled up her efforts to make sure the kids could have a safe environment and they could do it right while other communities were shutting down and or drastically reducing. So I wanna just take the opportunity to thank them for their great efforts. It was, I know the, the parents were extremely appreciative of it. It's uh. Uh, for, for many of them, it was their first time to get back with their friends. Today was also the first day for Jay Reynolds, our new public works director, and we are looking to a long and bright future with Jay and the town. Uh, the finance departments for both the town and the school department are readying for the start of the annual financial audit, which will begin shortly. We are anticipating another st strong financial report. I'm happy to report that the turf field replacement project is complete ahead of schedule. Additionally, the track resurfacing and tennis court resurfacing projects are complete. And then while, uh, meanwhile, while those are going on, uh, we're, the construction of side, sidewalk segment one is continuing to make good progress with the uh, new light poles uh, set into place today, and we should see those lit up in the near term. And then finally, for residents who are looking to dispose of returnable bottles at the recycling center, we're now accepting those donations. Uh, we're slowly bringing everything back online, uh, but the staff is able to handle those now. And we will be reviewing the status of the swap shop in September. And uh, we're looking to uh, come back with that in the near term. Uh, we're just trying to find a way to do it safely. So stand by for future updates on that. And then the last uh, point I wanted to raise was uh, in keeping with additional well, operating, uh, sorry, in keeping with trying to find training opportunities, uh, staff, uh, many of the department has tomorrow are taking place in the in the diversity workshop that's being put on by May Municipal Association. I know uh, Councilor Jordan, myself, and Councilor Devereaux have uh, taken this course earlier uh, in the summer, and uh, I've put the opportunity out to department heads, and many of them are taking advantage of that tomorrow. So. Uh, we're trying to work on our implicit bias training and, uh, and, and learn as we go in, in order to serve our community better. So that would be my re report. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for that? No. Um, and I also want to say thank you to community services and for all of the, the work they did I walk often on the school campuses and I saw the campers um, nearly every day who looked like they were having a blast just dancing around and running around and playing basketball. Um, and I also saw Kathy out there with doing mask and distancing patrol a couple times. So thanks for all of that work. Um, seems like they had a very good summer. Okay. So next on the agenda is review of the draft minutes of the virtual meetings from July 13th, 2020 and July 20th, 2020, which was a special meeting. Um, unless someone objects, I think we should probably just take those up together. So do I have a motion to approve the draft minutes from July 13th, 2020 and July 20th, 2020 meetings? So moved. So moved. Penny, is there a second? Second. Jeremy, thanks. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? 
Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item number 108-2020, the well at Jordan's farm. Oh, uh, introduce this and then get to you, Penny. I see your hand. Um, the well at Jordan's farm renewal liquor license. Um, Penny, go ahead. And then Caitlin. Um, I need to recuse myself because uh, Jason is a business partner with Jordan's Farm. Thank you. Um, Caitlin? I just have to disclose that I do business with the well. Thank you. Does anyone have any issue they'd like to raise with regard to that? No. Uh, Jamie? I was just going to disclose that my son is an employee of one of the partners in this business. Thank you. Um, any anyone have any concerns about that? Okay. Um, and I'll just note uh, before we get to a motion um, that no concerns have been report, reported by the Code Enforcement Office, Police, or Fire Department. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to approve the renewal malt liquor wine and spirits license for the well llc jason williams dba the well at jordan's farm located 19 wells road as presented um, and and penny will be recused from this so moved thank you valerie seconded by jeremy um, any discussion on this item all right all in favor Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries with six yeas. Thank you. Item number 109-2020, grant authorization for the Shore Road Rehabilitation Preliminary Design. Um, at the workshop held on September 4th, the town council was provided with an overview and at this point, um, we are looking to move on to the next step of the project for funding of the preliminary design. Um, I don't know, Maureen, if you have anything to add at this point. No, no pressure, there's nothing to say. Do I have a motion to authorize a grant application to PACTS for the preliminary engineering design of the Shore Road Rehabilitation Project in the amount of $172,000 with a 25% match provided by the town in the amount of $43,000. So moved. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there a second? second? Second. Thank you, Penny. And Jamie helpfully reminded me, I just missed the public comment period. Um, so before the town council discusses, uh, is there anyone who wishes to comment on this item? Okay, seeing no one. So any discussion? Uh, among the council. Jamie? I just have a question. Um, I know that um, part of the funding for this um, from the municipal budget standpoint got pushed out with the um, budget redo. Maureen, I don't know if you can just, I, I've had a few people, particularly in the um, Oakhurst neighborhood, and I know that they met with Matt and um, Chief Fenton. I'm not sure who else met with you, Matt, but, um, some people with some concerns about some other traffic related issues in the Oakhurst neighborhood. And one of the things that I had told them when I met with them was some of the ongoing work that was going to be um, coming up on the Shore Road Rehab Project. And I just didn't, I didn't have a sense of where we are on broad strokes timing for any of that now. So Maureen, you, either you or Matt, if either one of you wants to address it. Uh I'm, I'm just looking for a way to get you some money to move to the next step. So. Yeah. Uh, no, I understand. But just gen yeah. generally speaking, since we're talking about the topic. Yeah. And, and we, this, the very next step would be to start some preliminary design. Uh, you held a, a workshop and got some really good public comment. Uh, and the next step would be to take that public comment, take the comment from the council, and, and hire an engineering firm to start that design 
and then you know we want to bring it back for council input for planning uh, excuse me for public input and frankly all of that is on hold and if we can get this design money we can start the the train on the track again and i'll i'll defer to matt if i may madam chair uh the, the council may recall that uh this was one of the items that uh was originally in our capital planning for this year's budget that uh, that fell by the wayside. However, uh, with the opportunity to perhaps uh, leverage some funds through PACs, uh, it's a good opportunity now to, to try to at least do that. And if we do receive it, then I would come back to the council with a funding request uh, that we would have to find one, one way or the other, possibly an unassigned fund balance would be the way to, to fund that if we were so lucky to receive it. But it's a, these are very competitive grants uh, for one. Uh, but we, you know, if you never, if you never in, yeah, you never have the opportunity to win it. So, I, I know uh, we basically were, you know, trying to find the council's approval so we can move this forward. And if if we can get ahead of the game, then that would be awesome. Uh, but if we, uh, like I say, if we never ask, we'll never find out. So this is just our, our our shot at shot at trying to get some additional funding. What's the anticipated okay. decision date on the grant? Do we know that? Maureen, you're, mute. Maureen, you're muted. <laughs> so the deadline is August 17th, and then it goes to the PACS planning committee, and then it goes to the policy committee. So I really think this is a decision that's, that we're going to hear about in September. It's a very quick turnaround. So that's good. And so if, if we were fortunate enough to get it, are we conceivably off on the project by only a few months to six months as opposed to at least a year or more or that would be i think that's an accurate statement council garvin uh, probably six okay. that probably it probably buys us six months uh six okay. it actually probably buys us six to eight months in in progress uh, that we can that we can uh tap into and i appreciate um chairman adams the indulgence here. I, I it was just to be able to answer this question around Overall, I, I, I've run into some other people that have, have just, you know, remembered the workshop that was back in September. I think um, an, another person who's been in touch with us about another issue on Shore Road had, was asking about it. So um, anyway, it's just helpful to have sort of a working knowledge of the broad schedule. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, thanks, Jamie. Those were helpful questions. Um, okay. so. All in favor of the motion on the table. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes, and also I meant to add, thank you, Maureen, for always looking for these types of things. You're very good at doing that and really appreciate it. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 110-2020, referral to the planning board, review of the 2019 comprehensive plan recommendation number 86. Um, so this item relates to the um, proposed amendments that were forwarded to the planning board regarding the short-term rental ordinance. The council discussed a possible amendment to the 2019 comprehensive plan recommendation number 86, resulting from the proposed amendment to limit short-term rental operations to primary residents. Um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Do I have a motion to refer to the planning board for review an amendment to the 2019 comprehensive plan recommendation number 86 to reflect the proposed amendments to limit short term rental operations to primary residents. So moved. Thank you, Penny. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Valerie. Um, any discussion on this item? Chris, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so surprisingly, I'm going to be voting yes on this as I look at it, but only while explicitly calling out an aspect of what we're doing here. This is just revising recommendation number 86. This is not revising any other section of the comp plan. 
This motion is solely rec revising recommendation number 86. So with that blatantly, very clearly spelled out that it is solely revising recommendation 86, that's the only part of the comp plan that is being touched under this motion, I'll be voting yes. Thanks, Chris. Um, anyone else? Any other comment? Oh, yes, Matt. Madam Chair, I just wanted to uh, express my gratitude to Councillor Straw for finding uh, the, the fine point and pointing it out that uh, uh, we had inadvertently shipped the whole uh, business over to the planning board for review. And uh, he, uh, I'm grateful for him looking at that and saying, I don't think we took action on this recommendation. And that's why uh, we placed it here tonight. So. Uh, I appreciate Councillor Straw and uh, the effort. It, it was appreciated by, by myself and staff. So thank you sincerely. <laughs> well, thanks, but you won't have to put up with my nitpicking much longer. So. <laughs> it's helpful, believe me. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, all in favor. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? It looks like we lost him. I'm thinking he was having some technical issues. <laughs> Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries six yeas. Thank you. Um, and Chris, it sounds like we're going to miss you because. You do some well, you won't see me. I don't know if you'll all miss me. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, miss, we'll miss your attention to detail for sure. All right, item 111-2020, Village Green Flagpole Donations. Um, the town has received three generous donations for the cost difference for a flagpole upgrade um, on the new Village Green. Very much appreciated. Um, and we'll be taking action on that this evening. Is there any um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. We're looking for a motion to accept the generous donations in the amount of $1,134 each from Tom Thomas Egan. Jeffrey Holden and James Hubner for the Village Green Flagpole Upgrade. On behalf of the Town of Cape Elizabeth, the Town Council thanks Mr. Egan, Mr. Holden, and Mr. Hubner for their donations and acknowledges their community spirit in upgrading the flagpole for the public to enjoy. Um, do I have a motion? Jamie? Thank you. And Valerie, second. Um, any discussion on this item? Matt? Madam Chair, if I may, uh, uh, none of the gentlemen were able to join uh, council this evening, uh, but Jim Hubner had sent along a comment that he asked me to, to read in his, uh, in his honor, uh, or at his request would be a better way to put it, I guess. Uh, Tom Egan, Jeff Holden, and I, meaning Jim Hubner, are all honored that we were able to contribute to the purchase and installation of the new flagpole at the town center. I smile every time I go by it. And, uh, I just want to express our gratitude as well. Completely unsolicited, uh, just a really kind gesture by all three gentlemen, and uh, it it made a enormous difference on on the magni magnificent park next door. So uh, that's all. Thanks for relaying that, and thank you. Um, that's very generous to very generous of those three gentlemen. So we appreciate it. Um, all right, all in favor of the motion. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes, and apologies, my connection dropped off briefly there. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, item 112-2020, consideration of referring ordinances relating to fences to the ordinance committee. Um, we received some correspondence regarding fence heights and a request that the ordinance committee 
review this and perhaps um, draft an ordinance regarding fence heights to regulate those within our community. Um, any public comment this evening on that item? Seeing no one. Um, and it was my request to include this on the agenda. So I'll go ahead and just make the motion to refer to the ordinance committee um, for review uh, whether a permit or local ordinance regulating fence height or, well, I guess not whether, okay. I didn't think through that motion before I started talking. Um, so refer for review um, a local ordinance regulating fence height and or location to the ordinance committee. Um, do I have a second? Valerie, thank you. Um, discussion on this item. Penny? Um, just a, a, a question if we were to move this forward to the ordinance committee, um, whether where you want to put it relative from a priority perspective. Um, currently, we're working on uh, reviewing pesticide and uh, what actions we might be taking relative to that. So we're in a research mode um, around that as well as the vernal pools. We're in a research mode relative to that. So uh, if it is to go forward to have a relative feel for uh, where it might sit from a priority perspective. I don't know if anyone else had a thought on this. My thought is that it would go in line behind the other items that you're already dealing with. And I mean, there, there is, as I understand, perhaps a possibility to make any ordinance retroactive if that was a concern at that point, but. recently and you have quite a list so this would just go in line behind everything else. Um, any other discussion? Jamie? Just a quick question. Is, is there, I, I went looking not exhaustively, I'll admit maybe Chris looked at it more closely than I did. Is, is there anything that addresses this in, in the current building codes? Matt? If I may, through the chair, uh, currently fences are not regulated. Uh, you do not need to get a building permit uh, for them in the town. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to height is usually the big po point of concern uh, where the state has laws relating to that and they specifically to what they call spite fences, meaning that uh, you want to spite your neighbor so they can't see beyond it, uh, but they're you know, it's, it's these, these complaints are, are rare uh, when it comes to fences. Uh, it's not something that Ben receives a lot of complaints on. Uh, maybe one a year on average uh, is when, is usually when there's a new fence that is installed. So, uh, but some towns do regulate it as far as height and, uh, and then they'd make, you know, they do have people they consider a structure. So they ask them to get a building permit. Uh, to, to place it and uh, you know ultimately pe people will come in and ask staff for guidance as to placement of a fence and things along those lines generally they're recommended to, to leave space uh, you know so they can maintain the wall uh, oftentimes they'll take that advice other times they will not uh, so it's a it's, it's a sensitive subject when it comes down to it uh, as, as you saw by your emails but uh but it's one that we do not get a high level of complaints filed uh, in, you know, at least through the code officer. Thanks. Any? Yeah, prior to this uh, meeting, I did a little bit of research on the state um, um, regulations or uh, guidance around fence and fence heights and did a little bit of research in uh, around other towns as well as trying to delve into our own um, ordinances. And I did a nice drive around town and looked at fences 
um, and saw some other fences on, on Shore Road that were quite nice looking fences. Um, and, and, um, and I started thinking about these fences. Um, and many times people build fences for maybe they're going to put a swimming pool in. Um, maybe they uh, want to sunbathe naked in their backyard, I don't know. Um, but for many different reasons, people will erect fences. Um, I went and looked at this fence and, um, and uh, I understood the people's um, concerns. I might not have chosen that style or that uh, uh, material or whatever. Uh, but those people own that property and, um, and can choose to uh, put a fence up if they want to put a fence up. And Cape Elizabeth isn't a gated community. Cape Elizabeth is a community where people have uh, rights um, and rights relative to their property. So um, I, will, I will support whatever uh, the majority of the council wants to do relative to um, ordinance and whether it goes to the ordinance committee and whether it's something we want to review. Uh, but that's kind of my position on fences at this point in time. And there are some really beautiful fences in Cape Elizabeth if you take a ride around. It's really pretty cool. Matt? Madam Chair, if I may, and I apologize, uh, Councilor Garvin, I, 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 I misspoke on a couple of points. There are two, there are a couple of other regulations, as uh, Councilor Jordan, uh, with her comments, reminded me. Uh, you do have to put a fence up around pools. That's, that's state law. Uh, that is also administered locally. Uh, so there is, you know, they do have to have that, uh, and that's, that's a live item. The other item is that uh, the location of the fence cannot be close to uh, uh, in this case, the one on Cragmore, the intersection of Cragmore and Shore Road, they need to be 20 feet from the entrance of that road. They need to have that adjusted so it does not become a, a, a hindrance to, to sight lines and sight distances. So there is some, that's the other area of regulation that we do have locally uh, as far as placement of, placement of fences. So that's gonna create an unsafe condition uh, and Ben's working with the property owner to try to get that corrected at, at the present time. Chris? Uh, yeah, I would just uh, note that it's conceivable that the, and I'm going to just choosing um, a kind of out there number just to make the point. It's conceivable the ordinance committee could say, come back and say, yes, we're going to put a restriction in and say fences can't be more than 20 feet tall. Because as it stands right now, it sounds like it's only whatever the state law has and that applies in like it's on like spite fences or something like that or with a pool or whatever. But it, other absent whatever there is at the state law, it sounds like at the town level, there's nothing. So we could say it can't be more than 20 feet tall or some other number. But absent us doing something, there, it sounds like there, there's no restriction. But it also isn't lost on me that although he might put something in place with respect to fences, that wouldn't, unless it was, well, it depends on the scope of it, uh, it presumably wouldn't prevent someone from putting in a hedge of arbor vitae that's even taller uh, if that isn't construed as a fence. So uh, yeah, I, I recognize the tension that is there that needs to be addressed. Um, okay, any, any other discussion? Um, Jamie? Well, I, just, I, I support the idea of moving this to the ordinance committee for further discussion um, with the caveat that I think many people expect that when something's moved to the ordinance committee, it's going to come back with the recommended ordinance. And I would just point out that it might be, you know, it's, it's also conceivable that there could be discussion at the ordinance committee level, which would come back to say, we don't recommend taking any action on this or, or creating anything. So I, I, I don't, I, what I'm just trying to manage is, you know, if people are either watching the meeting now or watch it back later, um, supporting moving it to the ordinance committee doesn't necessarily mean that one supports the notion of there being an ordinance. So. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Jamie. And um, I could just 
put this out there because I thought there might be interest and it may not be a bad idea to look at whether we need a fence ordinance, but the motion is just for review by the committee. Um, so we aren't necessarily creating an ordinance. Um, Caitlin? Oh, I was just going to say I agree with what Penny said and Jamie. Thank you for pointing that out because I wanted to point that out as well. Thank you. Nothing further. Um, we will take a vote. All in favor. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? I think we lost him again. Lost him again. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Councilor Garvin, want to vote? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councilor Straw. Yes. Chairman Adams. Yes. Motion carries with six yeses. Thank you, Penny. I just want to make one last comment, and I'm sorry it's going to sound snarky, but Aroostook County has some gorgeous farms and uh, many of the fences are about snow. And I just needed to say that because there's beautiful property up there. And I would be proud to have a farm that looks like one in Aroostook County. Yes. And uh, I assume you all already know I totally disagree with all you on zoning issues. Um, <laughs> to the extent you don't, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings by saying I totally disagree with all of you on zoning issues. Thanks. Um, we knew that already, Chris. <laughs> I didn't need to read it. <laughs> All right, so moving along, um, item 113-2020, fiscal year 2020, capital improvement, uh, I don't know what the P stands, project, interproject budget transfers. Um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, Finance Director John Q has provided a memo outlining suggested fiscal year 2020 interproject budget transfers. So we are looking for a motion to authorize those budget transfers as outlined in the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Jamie. Is there a second? Valerie, thank you. Any discussion? Um, seeing none, all in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, item 114-2020, um, this regards the lease purchase agreement with TD Equipment Finance for fiscal year 2021 CIP projects. Um, there's a link in the agenda to the memo provided by John Q. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, we're looking for a motion to award a bid in the amount of $1,035,100 for a lease purchase contract to TD Equipment Finance at a rate of 1.296% for fiscal year 2021 capital improvement projects, replacement of Hannaford Field, a replacement tool carrier for the Public Works Department, 22 radios for the Police Department, and a communications tower. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Jamie. Is there a second? Thank you, Penny. Um, any discussion on this item? Matt? Uh, if, if I may, I just wanted to take a moment to thank John Q for working, uh, uh, reaching out to multiple banks to get 
uh, financing options for the town and the fact that we came in at 1.296. Uh, I have a really hard time saying that without breaking into a smile because it's probably the best rate that I've ever seen uh, for something along these lines. And it's, uh, he did a great job pulling that together and we're really happy to continue our positive relationship with TD Bank, especially in this, in this fashion. It's uh, based from where we were originally estimating at the start of the budget process to where we final, finalized being at uh, at this point is beyond uh, the best results we could ask for. So thank you for that, John. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, John. That's a crazy low rate. So excellent work. We're happy to have you on board. You. Um, Penny? Yeah, I just have a question for Matt. Does that mean that we got this turf field on sale? Or is that kind of what you're saying? It's about as close to saying that we got it on sale, Councilor Jordan, as I could, because I think we were originally thinking it was 4% was uh, what we were looking at for interest. So, uh, yeah, well, we, we get the highest quality turf with the lowest quality price. How's that? <laughs> And it looks gorgeous. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but uh, the field came out fantastic. It's got a beautiful emblem in the middle and uh, hopefully, you know, after I retire and you have to replace uh, <laughs> the turf, it'll be, people will look back on it and be happy with the project. <laughs> all right, um, if there's no other discussion, all in favor. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And item 115-2020, authorization of the order for the lease purchase agreement with TD Equipment Finance for fiscal year 2021 CIP projects. Um, so we are looking for an order to, I, I'm sorry, a motion to authorize the, the order as presented in this evening's agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot public comment. We do only have one attendee at this moment, but I, I do wanna give that opportunity before we jump in. Okay, seeing no one. Thank you, Jeremy, for that motion. Is there a second? Penny, thank you. Any discussion on this item? All in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Item 116-2020, carry forward balances from fiscal year 2020. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, again, John Q has prepared a memo relating to recommended carry forward balances, looking for a motion to authorize those carry forward balances as presented. So moved. Thank you, Penny. Is there a second? Jamie, thank you. Any discussion on this item? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 117-2020, Maine Municipal Association annual ballot. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, the ballot has been distributed to members and we're looking for a motion to authorize the town manager to vote on behalf of the town council, the slate of officers for the 2021 executive committee as presented by the Maine Municipal Association's nominating committee, and that's laid out specifically in the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there a second? Jamie, thank second. you. Um, any discussion on this item? Chris? 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to note that uh, I just did a quick perusal. And it seems like, uh, again, there's, there's just a dearth of uh, people from Cumberland County on the executive committee and in the leadership positions. And the MMA is really important. So um, as we obviously it requires people to make a commitment to taking on even, even further kind of thankless public service. But uh, just uh, it would be nice to see some Cumberland, more Cumberland County people that just so we are kind of fully represented on that executive committee. Um, that said, obviously, it's whoever puts their hats in, and this is the group that we've got that put the hats in. So I'll be voting yes. Um, all right, any other discussion? All in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, there's one, one attendee. Um, does that attendee wish to raise any uh, point not on the agenda this evening that pertains to Cape Elizabeth local government? No. Uh, Jamie? Um, I had a question about something not on the agenda. Um, Matt, any direction on um, return to in-person meetings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're somewhat challenged with the first floor uh, with the council chambers and then the, what they have for the number of folks available for X amount of square footage. Uh, we're we're, we're going to see probably an update on that. Um, I would say I'd anticipate at least through September uh, would be where you're looking at now. Because uh, of the size of the, of the council chamber to adequately space, you know, the council staff, as well as if, if you had a number of people come, uh, I think right now it's like for a thousand square feet, you can have five uh, attendees on something along those lines. So uh, that's a bit of a challenge when you have seven council members and then uh, myself and Deb uh, and then another person with the television studio. So uh, that's a little bit of a challenge, but I, I, I think those numbers are probably going to be revised in the nearer term. So but I would anticipate going at least through September. And a follow up, do you have you heard of anything relating to almost almost in the same way that the schools are considering sort of a hybrid model uh, for education? Um, I've been talking to some people about the fact that, you know, our zoom meetings have been well attended. Um, and it's it's actually opened up sort of a conduit to our proceedings and activities that maybe people, you know, didn't get to experience previously. And I didn't know if there's been any discussion around somehow combining, you know, actual in person meetings, but with some sort of zoom element for those that either are uncomfortable attending, or just, you know, it's more convenient for them not to. But if I may, Madam Chair, uh, to respond on that, I, I think, yeah, to see how this has resulted in I think more of a democratization of town government has been pretty awesome uh, to, to watch as a person who's been in it for 25 plus years. It's uh, to see the level of participation from the general public is, is, is beyond uh, in many ways what most towns could dream of. And I think Cape's an extreme, I mean, I think Cape as a town has been extremely plugged in. Uh, other towns, maybe not as much, uh, but I think overall, uh, you can't walk away from this experience and not say that is there a way that we can't integrate this as part of the approach going forward? Uh, much as, because I think it has opened up a lot of avenues for democracy uh, and local government. So, um, you know, much as the library has been very successful with online programming and has opened up a whole new avenue that they hadn't thought of before, I look at this from a, from a governance side and say, you know, is there a way that we could, we could add that in in the future? And, uh, but I think it has to be considered uh, for sure. And the only other issue with trying to do it now with the hybrid approach, after the second person watch, walks through the door, you have to say, okay, well, you're gonna have to either go outside and zoom in or, uh, so that's just the near term. But I think long-term it'd be a way that if we could find a way to, to have that, uh, we should try to explore it. 
it's, I mean, it's amazing. If you think about some of those meetings we had, you know, close to a hundred people a couple of times. I was worried that we were going to break outside of our uh, subscription numbers on, on zoom. And, uh, we came close. Luckily, we never broke that seal. But uh, but to see that happen, uh, in light of all the challenges we've seen this spring, I look at that as a as a definite win uh, for for folks. So uh, I'd like to find a way that we can integrate that going forward as well. Yeah, Jamie, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually just thinking about that this morning. That it would be nice when we start meeting again in person to continue the Zoom option. Um, and I was wondering, I was sort of thinking about how would that be possible since it's a little difficult to moderate like the questions coming in. And then I was thinking about how Valerie always brings up student involvement and maybe this would be a great opportunity to get a student involved in the council. And one of the roles that that student could be to moderate the, the Zoom discussion so we can keep that participation up. So. I, I don't know if we want to maybe talk about this in a workshop or something um, in the near future, Deb, yeah. Um, just a reminder that the um, remote meetings, it's not by state law, it's by the governor's executive order. So um, you, unless a law changes, you don't have total flexibility uh, at this point. I anticipate that there'll be a lot of input uh, into the legislature, but that might not be till, you know, the new session, you know, uh, at the beginning of the year. But just to keep that in mind that, um, you know, currently the law doesn't allow it. This is by executive order of the governor. And uh, so moving forward, we're gonna have to see if there are, are any law changes. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Does the law prohibit us from having participants via Zoom if we're meeting in person? Well, it the law doesn't allow for remote meetings, you know, for call-ins and different things like that. So, you know, I, I think this is along those lines. So I think we'd, um, you know, need to seek advice if the law doesn't directly um, address it. But as of right now, I would say, I, from what I understand, you know, for many years, it would not allow um, even a, you know, a hybrid approach. Um, so. Um, Jamie had a hand up and then Jeremy, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, it, I, I should maybe clarify the point. So what I'm really talking about is, is the public participation aspect, not the council participation, not the principles. Um, so, and I, I think the, I think the law as it currently stands absent the uh, governor's executive order, um, pertains to meeting, meeting principles, basically, the, the people that are uh, taking action or voting on, I, I, um, I, I'm not sure if that extends to public comment or not, but um, I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering if that might be um, something, that would be what I'd more specifically want to follow up on uh, regarding legal advice on that question I, I think once 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 we're greenlit to go back to chambers you know the 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 meeting principles all need to to be there uh, in order to take action but I, I do I do wonder if there isn't a way to preserve the public participation aspect of it particularly if audiences are restricted in number to begin with so Matt, yeah, did if you have a response to that? If I may, just, uh, yeah, thinking about that as well, you've seen a couple other communities that have had their meetings, but they've, uh, like Westbrook has had their meetings, but they have, they've been using their communities. Uh, they have that big theater that's uh, <laughs> enormous over there in Westbrook. So they've been doing that and they can space everybody about uh, apart there, but that's the exception uh, more than the rule. So, uh, but I do think, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Garvin. I think that there's a way that we could do that and. Uh, have the principals live, but have the attendees and find a way to flex that and get and provide more access, then uh, we should definitely, you know, if it needs an exec order or something along those lines, it should be definitely something that I would think the legislature would want to would want to uh, promote, uh, especially now how things have, has, have worked. But 
Jeremy, did you still have a comment or question? No, nothing of substance beyond what was just discussed. Okay, um, Valerie? I just wanted to bring up that um, I have some ideas for the Ralph Gould Award. And do we need to set up an executive session to talk about that? Or is that something we would talk about in workshop? I, if I may, I'd like to go to uh, uh, my, uh, my freedom of access uh, guru uh, in the top square, Deborah Lane, and uh, I'd ask her thoughts on, on how we can do that. We've talked about this before and technically it does not fall within an executive session. Um, so I know it gets interesting when you have folks, you know, that are, that are linked on Zoom and you're talking about uh, recipients, but um, it doesn't fall under executive session. So would that be something for a, a regular workshop? That could be that could be good to maybe double uh, double park that to have a you know if you want to do that have a brief workshop before the council meeting on September fourteenth and then uh, and then have that and then come into council council meeting after that you may not have as many participants uh, inquiring minds may not be as interested at the workshop side as they may be on the on the live uh, council meeting side we could schedule a workshop for, I'll say, a night when there's a competing <laughs> uh, high interest other meeting, like, oh, tomorrow. <laughs> true, true. Opposite the school board meeting. <laughs> you may not have direct democracy that night, Council <laughs> Um, If we do put that on a, um, as a workshop meeting before the September meeting, does anyone have an objection to starting at 6.30 with the workshop? No, not a problem. It's just a little, a little easier to prevent late nights for all of us. Um, so maybe let's, let's add that on for September. We will do that, Madam Chair. Okay, anything else before we adjourn? Are you sure you guys want to adjourn? It's only 8.22. Motion to adjourn. My family's <laughs> going to be worried. <laughs> Second. Thank you, Chris. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right, night everyone. Thank you all, have a great evening, sleep well. Thank you. <laughs>